I'm Mark Madsen. Hi, thanks for the nice intro. Thank you all for getting up early and being here. I'm going to start with just a, sort of a quick statement, which is that I've been a BI director and a head of analytics and a bunch of other things that people call different names. And I got to a point about 10 years ago where people started to get annoyed with the data warehouse group and the BI group. And, um, you know, we've been struggling for a long time. Our, our batch windows keep shrinking, the ETL jobs don't get done, data's not up when it's supposed to be, queries are slow, dashboards are slow. Um, and this has been going on for a long time. And we keep fixing them by just upgrading to the next version of the technology. And so people have started to say, well, you know, this, this data warehouse group, it's kind of like the crazy uncle of the organization. It just keeps doing the same thing over and over again and not getting any different results. So I want to go and look at some of what we do and talk about some of the assumptions. Uh, for example, our users tend to assume in the organization that the E in EDW means everything. And, you know, for us, it doesn't quite mean everything. It means the stuff that we chose to put in it, which is just tables, to make matters worse. Uh, what we meant was just that little cluster of tables over there. And so, you know, I've had questions like, aren't you loading your data from SAP? Yes, we are. Well, how come this data is not in there? Well, we didn't extract that. I thought the E meant everything. You know, there are 8,000 tables in SAP. Most of us wouldn't probably pull out more than a couple dozen of them. There's this giant galaxy of data that we've chosen not to load into the data warehouse because there wasn't a requirement, because it didn't seem valuable, or because it's not in a database. It's in a file or an email repository. It's living in logs. It's streaming data. And that's a lot of stuff. And the problem that you start to have when you start adding more and more sources and syndicated data and other things in is that you have to model it all. Some human being has to look at and understand every piece of data over here that you think you might want over here. And there is so much stuff out there with so many different schemas and so many different forms that there's not enough hours in the day for data architects to go out and figure it out. And yet, the data warehouse is built on the premise that you have to know all of that data so that you can model it and integrate it and put it in there. That's not going to work anymore. We can't keep up. Now, the good news, that was the bad news, but the good news is we did solve the size problem. Bigness in data is not a problem for query processing anymore. You might not believe that because you're running on an anemic server without enough memory and enough disk, but the reality is that most of the time you should not have any query performance problems due to hardware or database. This chart shows you an interesting aspect of that. There are three lines on this chart. The orange line at the very bottom of the chart that's the trajectory of a traditional single node share or shared disk database like an Oracle or a SQL Server or a DB2. You'll notice that since 2005, that line has barely inched upward. It's holding steady somewhere in the sub 500 terabyte range. Um, it's pretty hard to manage these things anywhere close to that, but that's the highest known number I've got for one of those databases in terms of size. Uh, the next line up, the green line, that's your massively parallel databases, your Vertica's, your Netezas, your Teradata's. Those things hold steady. This is old data. It was up to seven here. About 40 petabytes, 50 petabytes. Worked fine. So most of us don't have 40 to 50 petabytes. I know I didn't. So you really have a big gap between the original technologies that we've been using for the last 20 years in terms of database and these MPP databases, and yet most of us continue to cling to our old familiar friends. Despite the fact that there is more than an order of magnitude size, scale, and performance difference between these things. One of the challenges we've got is that analytics makes the problem worse. And by analytics, I mean all the algorithmic stuff, statistics, machine learning, that sort of thing. And the reason analytics kills performance in a database, or really any system, is that the, the processing problems are on the order of n squared or order n cubed. What that means is simply that 
as you increase the size of the data, the time that it takes to process that data goes up by the square or the cube of the size of that data. So small increases in data quickly put you in an inflection point and you go south and that's the end of the day. You can't do the processing. And that's a problem for every database. It's, it's just the nature of the problem of a lot of analytics. Now, <clears throat> since big's not a problem for query performance, or it shouldn't be, but analytics might be, you know, a lot of the big data people have, have also said, well, we're gonna replace all of this stuff and process all of that data. And you know, what do they mean by big? Well, forget the size thing, doesn't matter. So hierarchical structures and nested structures and non-key linked data and binary encoded values that aren't any kind of a type we have in the database. And deeply structured data, which is highly integrated, things like text and images. These are all digital representations of something, they're all data. And yet, we can't deal with any of these things very effectively in a database. So what we're really talking about with these things is complex or hard to manage with the technologies that we've got rather than big. The other thing is that the data sets themselves are slightly different, right? You've got the, that aspect of data and then you've got the interconnection and the linking. When you have a highly complex data model and you're bringing in other things all the time, and it's constantly changing, you're worried about linking this stuff. And when you have this complex data, like I just described, say images, what are you doing to that data to get information out of it? Because you don't query an image. You run an algorithm against the image to do feature extraction. The features are the data that you want. So you pull the data out and then you stick it into a database. And so a lot of what you do is you store this data, you process this data to extract new information from your existing data set and then you put that data back in. A lot of data processing, the analytics that deals with this stuff, is pulling those things out, putting them back in. Pulling patterns out like this, putting the patterns back in. That's a read-write workload on a read-only database. That was also never designed in for us, but this is the nature of a lot of the problems and a lot of the solutions people are trying to apply to those problems. As an example of data complexity, which is driving a lot of things, just think of the human genome, right? The number of genes dictates the complexity of an organization, and so we go from a bacteria with a few thousand uh, genes, moving up into the, the noble chicken with 14,000 genes, or sorry, 16, the fruit fly is 14. Human at the pinnacle, 22,000, but does anybody know what the most complex organism we have sequenced to date is? No, it's the noble grape. So, bow down to the new overlords. Now, this was built on a flawed assumption. Um, the assumption, of course, was just like our size assumption. It's more things, so it must be more complicated. But it's more of the same things. The interesting stuff happens with the interactions between the genes, right? It's not that you have this many, it's that this one talks to that one, which causes this thing, which makes this thing happen. Network effects, systemic behaviors, they build up and they stack up. That's the nature of complexity and that is the same nature of complexity as data. And if you go and look at genomics, there's a whole branch of information theory around genes and you find the same things. So the kinds of problems that you're starting to face aren't purely, I've got a bunch of tables, it's all the different ways you can relate this stuff and the fact that every year you're being asked to add not just more data in the same tables, more tables, more objects, more things. And so I like to step back sometimes and just think about what it is I'm dealing with and then look at the data warehouse environment, the BI environment, the analytics environment, and think about the data. So I throw things into three buckets when I'm thinking about them in terms of how I'm gonna deal with them on my technology stack. One, transaction data. We all know what this is. We've been dealing with it for 25 years. That's the heart of a $40 billion data warehouse industry right there. The stuff that's not so convenient is all of these streaming log messages, whether it's web clicks or location traces from your phone. It's events, 
it's stuff that happens, but it's not the event, right? The purchase event triggers something on a website, which then triggers somebody to go into a warehouse and pull a product off a shelf and stick it into a box and send it to you. And all of these little things that happen in a process are now instrumented. You know, when a guy is driving through a warehouse with a forklift and picking things off of shelves, every single one of those little events, where he went, what path he followed, what he picked, what he put into the box, every single one of those things has an event associated with it. And so you have all of those events, plus you have all of the, say, web clicks and the email you sent that triggered somebody to click on a website or click on a link and go to a website to buy this thing. All of those events are not transactions, they're just events. They happen and they're time series and they get lost sometimes, they're noisy because they're not so important. The transaction has dollars in it. Somebody is expecting something from it and so transactions are important. You manage each one carefully in an ACID compliant database and you never lose those things if you can help it. Events people don't deal with as much. Programmers write programs which generate events. It's a different story. And so it's inconvenient. The third thing is just what people say. We get this not just from social media feeds. Big Data World loves to talk about social media feeds because they are somehow exciting. You know, the latest Twitter messages about Campbell's soup. But it's more than that, right? There's the Facebook stuff, there's blogs, there's reviews, there's just content mining on the web for actual review sites that review things professionally. There is customer survey data, right? There are call center logs. A uh, place I worked at, we used to speech to text all of the logs and then stick them into a system. So you're getting all kinds of stuff that is involved with what people say, it's declarative data, it's not events, and it's not transactions. But people want to use all three of these things and their value, just like the complexity of genes or the complexity of a, of a star schema, is not in the individual tables, it's the linking of those things. So when you take these three types of data or classes of data and you start putting them together, you can learn a lot of new stuff. Which is why people want to marry your web tracking feed to your email tracking feed, to your customer database, to your transactions, to everything that happened post-transaction to get a bigger and richer picture. But that's complex, and we can really only deal effectively with the first thing on here, and that's all we've been doing. And a lot of the big data revolution is, what about the other two thirds on that? So sensors and events, they don't fit well. And the reason they don't fit well is because we're not talking sets anymore. Relational database and transactions is all built up around set theory. Things are or are not in sets. A lot of times when you're dealing with event series and time series data, you're looking for patterns. This happened and then this totally different event happened and then this other event happened and then that other event happened. There's no single query to resolve this and get the full payload of data. You can only look at the keys because each table is slightly different because the event payloads are different. So you can't do all of the analysis. Time series are impoverished in a database because it deals in sets. Sets have no natural ordering. There is no time in a set, that's just an attribute. And so when you want to look across time series and match them up, you have problems. And this is a linear algebra problem or a graph theory problem. This is not a relational problem. The other thing is what people say, what they type into their phones, what they give you in customer surveys, what you shout into the phone at the United Rep as they defer your flight for the third time. All of that text, all of what people say, where does it go? It doesn't go into a database usually because databases really only have clobs, blobs, and uh, binary representations of data. And so it goes into content management systems, and it goes into file management systems, and it goes into repositories, or it just streams by and it gets ignored. But it's not unstructured. One of the big lies of the big data market has been We've got all this unstructured data and we can't manage it. And what they really mean is we have all of this data that we haven't modeled. Because of course it's got structure. If it didn't have structure, it wouldn't be data. It would be noise. So when you take text, of course it's got deep, highly complex, nuanced structure that is not easily flattenable. Uh, the last time I did a real text mining project, which is going on 12 years now, our schema, once we unpacked everything in a body of reviews, was 112 tables. 
And that was just what information was stored in those reviews. So what you have is a modeling problem. And we, as modelers, don't have any techniques to deal with really complex and, in particular, dynamically changing models. And so when you start to have dynamic changing, you have new things coming in, you've got complex data structures from which you derive data and then store it back, you have a very different modeling and different code pipeline problem. When you look at the pipelines, the top line on here is sort of what we're used to. Humans enter data into forms, the data gets stored, gets extracted, cleansed, load, and then you use it. Pretty straight pipeline, and then there's some feedback. You're using the data, it's bad, we gotta clean it. I don't have this data, let's extract it. We don't have this data in the company, let's fix the form. Or let's put an edit check on the form so people stop entering a 51st state into the state field. Machine data, event log data, sensor data, things like that, everything from Google Analytics to mobile traces from truck sensors goes through two processes. First, a programmer in the basement of some organization writes some Java code, and then that thing goes somewhere. Maybe it gets burned into firmware on a chip on a device, and then that thing's put into production and it's running and it's sending its data, which we then capture and use, because a lot of that is actually in an actuation cycle. Data happens, it triggers other things to happen after it's captured, and then it gets put back. Sometimes there's a human in the loop, sometimes there isn't. That is a very different process when there's no human in the loop where the only person, or the only responsibility of the human is to watch the squiggly line, and when it goes above a thir certain threshold, to do something about it. So humans become governors over the system. And this is true of digital media, recommendation engines, a lot of things have this kind of a process, as well as physical world things, like failure sensors in industrial equipment. So you capture it, but you can also store it. So you store it for some period of time. You don't query this stuff because you don't need to query this stuff. And if you queried it, all you would get is counts of events and some really boring sums and aggregates that tell you no useful information. Because the information is in a time series, it's not in the sum or the count. It's not in the set operation. So you store it, you cleanse it, and you use it. And your use is very often to build a more complex model out of the simple event series. So you take these events, you interpolate new events, you extract patterns, you store that stuff, that's what you query. The whole data science thing, a lot of it is built around that rather than the other data. Now the other thing is what happens when something goes wrong with the data, it's gonna take a lot longer to fix it, if ever. So you have a different data quality life cycle too because you can't clean up sensor data, it just keeps coming in whether you like it or not. And if that data doesn't match the table in your database, it's not going to insert into that table. So you better figure out how you're gonna get and store that data without using a database. Or by using a database that allows you to have variable structures because a programmer will make a change without telling you. And so what we're doing is we're taking the information and we're moving it into sort of an actuation sense. No more human eyeballs necessarily, or human eyeballs to only approve what happens. And we're doing detecting. Right? We're watching and detecting and alerting rather than capturing and putting on screen and the alert is passive. It's traffic lighted in your dashboard and you look at it. These alerts are active. They send you an email, they make a phone call, they page you, or they intercede and kick off a safety control in an industrial system. What have we been using to try and serve some of these new needs? This is the original paper from 1988, Data Warehouse an architecture for a business and information system where we use the term data warehouse, hopefully uh, researched correctly, for the very first time in print. It's got everything in it that you're building today. It's fully conceptual. It is an architecture. An architecture is not a blueprint. Blueprints tell you what materials to use. This product, that product, these bricks, that concrete. An architecture says, this is what this building is going to look like and this is what it's going to do. This is what a data warehouse does. These are the capabilities it has. This is the kind of information maybe it contains. Nowhere in here does it say thou shalt use a relational database. And it's got things on here we still don't have today. It has multiple data models. It has a data model for everybody. And then it's got the idea of local private data for department, for your own interpretation of the sales metrics, whatever it might be. 
It's a much richer model in the original conception because it's a multi-model concept, not one giant global model that everybody must agree to. Um, it's a very puritanical model we have fallen into from, from this. The other thing it gives you is completely autonomous user local data, their own sandbox. So there's actually three different areas of data in this thing, ignoring all the data processing. Where did it come from? Well, that paper was written in 1988. 1988, for some reason, people had crazy hair. Um, there was really no commercial email. There was the barely you know, a public internet. The state of the art, 100 megabytes, uh, $10,000 per gigabyte for enterprise storage. Oracle Apps first started with General Ledger in 1988. SAP entered the US market for the very first time in 1988. There was no ERP. So what were people doing? They were building data warehouses with a handful of sources because there weren't that many. Back then, you could understand all of your sources and you could count the number of tables in each one and you could count the number of tables you were putting into the data warehouse. On the technology front, the alternative to the kind of, of operating systems we were using, uh, VMS, MVS, VM, AS400s, all these different kind of proprietary mainframe systems and mini, system, mini computer systems. There was this other database, or sorry, database. There was this other operating system that, that people were using, and it was run by a bunch of long-haired freaks. They all wore sandals in the data center. People didn't like them very much. And I was one of those guys. And so I really didn't fit into the base metals manufacturing industry with the lifer IT people who were there. And we saw this stuff and said, this is going to change a lot of things. But it took a really long time for that to happen. The other thing, mobile. Right? There was no mobile. We had green screen terminals for everything. So what was our context in building an architecture for data warehousing? It was couple of proprietary systems, not many tables, scarce data. We didn't have lots of data. You could model everything. We didn't have a lot of resources. Disks were slow. Scarce memory. The, the very first system that I worked on that actually built a data warehouse in the sort of metaphor sense, the, the dimensional model sense, had 756 megabytes of memory. So scarce resources, highly expensive, core financials only, nobody had any data, so anything you gave them made them super, super happy. All right? We would just publish reports. Interaction's kind of hard on a 3270 green screen, and it's kind of hard on a, a machine that's not even running Windows yet. But that's a publishing model. We get the data, we put it into a schema, you run some queries, you run a report, out goes the data. Tomorrow, same thing happens. It's a read-only cycle of moving data, and that's the metaphor we've been using for BI ever since. Problem is, as you just saw with some of these other things, it's not a read-only problem anymore. The, the need is for more than just publish data out. So you have to go back to things like decision support. You go back to places where I got my start in this field in behavioral economics and other weird stuff. It's coming back again because just getting data out isn't enough. You have to think about what's the system or the context in which your BI operates. Your BI operates in sort of a, a closed loop decision cycle like this. You've got two cycles, but they go, both go through the middle. And that is, you're watching your business to make sure stuff doesn't go wrong. That's monitoring. Query reporting and dashboards, that's what they do. Data comes in, we publish some trend charts, here's some top 10 reports, here's a dashboard of what's going on. When something is bad on a report, a dashboard, or an alert, then you analyze those exceptions. You go in and you say, what's going on with this? And you look at it, you see, oh, we were short-staffed in this region with, with salespeople, and so sales are off in that region. Okay, I understand it, and I can move on. Well, that's just analyzing an exception, that's cube spinning in OLAP, that's running some ad hoc queries. It's not the, the static reports and dashboards, it's the more dynamic and interactive stuff. Then you get into the causal analysis. If you actually can't find the answer in that data, then you have to roll up your sleeves. And this is what the harder core analysts do. And it might just be more SQL queries. 
But what if your database doesn't have the information? I've been in many situations where the analysis I personally needed to do had to go and find other data that was not in the data warehouse because the warehouse was common core transactions. I need the transaction flags out of the SAP tables. I need some logistics data out of the logistics system that nobody in their right mind ever thought they would need. Why would you need that? You don't report on that. You don't track that. It's not part of a KPI. Why do I need it? Diagnostics. This showed a problem. This analysis gave me the context of the problem. Now I need to dig in and find out why is this happening? What's the model of operation of the system? And then maybe I have the cause. And then we can decide what to do about it. When you have to decide what to do, it's not just read a report and say, oh, I'm going to do this. If it's anything complicated, which by the time it hit this stage, it probably is, you're going to go to a meeting. Or you're going to send an email to one of your peers. Or you're going to call your boss and say, I think we have a problem here, and this is what I think it is. Now you've got to communicate the results of your analysis. Or the end user has to communicate the results of their analysis. And how do they do this? Push to Excel, make a chart, store it in PowerPoint. Not a very effective communication mechanism, and not a very effective visualization mechanism. And if I come in and I look at that thing you just gave me and I disagree with it, no effective way to question your assumptions about the data. Which is why you have things like data storytelling or interactive data exploration tools, because they help you not just analyze but communicate. And then, of course, the last thing is we've got to act. So we decide and we act. How do we decide? Well, we got together in a meeting and we said, well, here's three options. Let's do this and see what happens. And then you act. And in its simple examples where the process does not change, it just loops back around. Things got fixed. The dashboard goes back to normal. You're done. Go on the other side of the process. You change the process. Our process is broken. And it keeps doing bad things. So what are we going to do? We're going to change it. What happens when you change a process? when you change how people do work. Their workflow changes. The forms in the ERP systems they're using change. The database changes. We collect new data. Why do we collect new data? Because the monitoring would have tripped on the old data and not really detected this. Now we need new data to say, here's how to track this problem. Here's a new KPI and a new metric, which means we go back into monitoring cycles again. BI does this, does it really well. I would say this is a solved problem. You're basically just putting lipstick on a pig when you try and make dashboards a tiny increment better when you have a whole field of other areas that you can deal with, which is why we have things like discovery and exploration and so forth. Because the other side of this process has been left up to users themselves. And what do users themselves typically do? They go out and buy things these days because technology is a commodity and they use Excel. And they layer complexity on top of complexity. We gave them data. They evolved a process which used that data, which made a more complex process, which needed more data, which needed more monitoring. So we put that in the warehouse and added more reports and added more tables and gave them more information. And they solved a different problem, which changed a process. And that cycling has built up a level of complexity and a level of data needs that we're now struggling to meet. Because 20 years on, we've been so successful at doing this that we've created a different problem a complexity problem involving the interaction of all of the moving parts on the technology side and the data on the other side. When we started out back in 1988, remember, yeah, my, my first data warehouse, which was actually circa 1992, had three sources. It sourced from a total of 12 tables and two flat files. Now, the last thing that I built that was a real data warehouse had 47 systems and I think 1,800 tables. We needed a cadre of people to figure out what the hell to extract and model out of that. The context diagrams look something like this. And the thing is, it's growing complexity that's also created a context shift from the simple that, we've, that we started with to where we are now. And our architecture has served us well for this period, but it's reached its limits. And the limits have to do with complexity. Because now, it's not just internal systems either. It's the event logs those internal systems generate. It's weird stuff that we never thought we would even see because we didn't have event traces back then. We didn't have clickstream. We didn't have 24 by 7 operation. We didn't have external software applications. Most people in most organizations also have Salesforce or NetSuite or Workday or a dozen other external service providers that have applications. And how do we get the data? ETL. ETL has to point to something, like a database or a file. 
There is no database or file. There's an API, if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, you scrape data off of screen. So getting the data has become a hurdle just like it was 25 years ago when we had no ETL tools. Because we don't really have ETL tools for this either. We have to write code. Web developers write code to fetch data from APIs. There's no schema in there. You have to read documentation on APIs and figure out what the payloads are. And so the complexity is not purely in a source systems. It's the way we get the data. It's the level of access and the level of metadata because developers don't like metadata. So, no data layer access. No data layer access even at the API level. Streams are becoming an important thing because a lot of modern application design is built not around the old model of client server, but the new model of distributed computing. Client server was call that thing, wait, get the answer back. That's basically what SQL does. Send a query and you get the answer back. These are not RPC based systems, no remote procedure calls here. I send a message and I forget. Fire and forget models. Each node of communication is both a client and a server. It's a dessert and a floor topping. And the problem with that is that it defines a totally different architecture. And so you have to worry about things with that. And then you're dealing with observations and transactions. And so we've got this current state, can't keep up, can't keep up with new data requests. My biggest problem as an analytics manager was people coming to me and saying, we need this data. And I would say, well, I can get it to you in six weeks. Or maybe if we're lucky, I can get it to you in two weeks and they need it in a week, or they need it in three weeks, and I said six, and by the time I do get it to them, they're done. Because the other thing that's happened is that there are a lot of process changes that turn faster than the data warehouse cycle. When they change faster than you can react, you're in a bad spot. Because from that spot, you will never be able to serve their needs, and so what will they do? They'll go out and buy ClickView or Tableau, or they'll use Microsoft Access. They will do something to get the job done that they need to get done because that's their job. They're not trying to be antagonistic. They're just trying to get their job done and you can't help them. So you have to be able to turn faster. Big data market has an answer for this, of course. Burn the mother down. <laughs> use Hadoop or something like that, right? Every vendor's got their thing. But of course, Hadoop is, is the sort of core platform that we're talking about in a lot of that market because that's the, the bottom layer that everything builds up from. And so uh, a lot of times burning your house down to remodel is not really the best answer. So, you know, wh what are they really saying? They're saying the same thing we said 25 years ago. Let's centralize because that solves all problems. Well, what is a Hadoop cluster? It, it, as, as envisioned in the data lake concept or whatever, piece of marketing crap you're reading from these guys. It is the Death Star. The first Death Star got blown up. So we built a new Death Star that's gonna solve the problems better this time because we use different technology. This one is fully operational even though it's not been built yet. Well, what does that do? In the end, it still creates bottlenecks. Now, there are data architecture differences, but it still creates problems because all things funnel in and then all things span back out. And the data warehouse has this problem. One global schema. ETL synchronizes to that schema. BI synchronizes to that schema. Nothing happens until you change the schema. And that's a problem because that, in, that enforces a single global model that everybody must agree on over everything. And if you think about even small problems, I've got marketing people I have to serve needs for out of my data warehouse. They don't need perfect numbers. They don't need perfect data. Plus or minus five or 10% good enough because it's directional. There's no absolutes in that world. Things change all the time. People's behaviors change. So data quality there is different than data quality over my financial metrics, right? The use of data is what dictates the quality not the production of data or how you store it. And so it's good enough for some things, but not good enough for other things. And what you really need to know with data quality is what's it good enough for. And our model says there's only one type of data quality because there's only one model. Whoever has the strictest use wins. The strictest use puts the most burden on ETL developers and data quality developers to clean up the data, which means that what might take one day to load into a simple table or to put into a file system and then point some tool at, instead takes two weeks. 
because I have to clean this data up so that it will synchronize with everything else in the data model without causing any problems because a null over here, or a bad foreign key reference, will create bad data for some other query that somebody else might add. That's great for important production data. That's not great when one person needs the data. So it's too strict. It's not flexible and it slows you down. So we have to think about how we're gonna solve this problem because we've become the bottleneck, right? First of all, there's all that data out there, but we only grab the yellow dots. So we don't have all of the data, despite the fact that we think we do. And number two, we've gotta make it all nice and clean and neat. So we've designed for stability. We've designed in a way that handles the common core use cases of data and does it very, very well. But we need something to deal with adaptivity, or adaptability. We have to be able to modify things. So our approach then, instead of burn the mother down, is, well, which is best, third normal form or dimensional? St. Ralph the stellar, St. Inman the normal? I don't know. Well, the real answer, neither, right? We're trying to go to the sources of old thinking that got us to where we got today, that have given us 25 years in an amazing set of systems. But the problems that I've just defined are not the problems that they were solving. And so you can't model all of the data before use. You can't do everything in advance. You have to find ways to be reactive. That big schema change is a problem. What happens when you change the data model in your data warehouse, when you take a dimensional model and change its granularity? You spend a weekend processing three, five, whatever years of history from source, and you better hope you had all of the original data exactly as it was recorded and that it's not on tape in a salt mine. And yes, that did happen to me. Um, five years of data, some of it archived onto tapes in a salt mine. We restored it, it didn't match the database they had created. Fun ensued for three months. What's the big data answer? They've got answers for everything. Schema on read, right? Forget about schema. Schema's not important. Just write the data out, we'll figure it out when we read it. That's great when you're a developer and you write out your data and you're the only person reading it. Schema on read fails, fails utterly, when you suddenly have two programs accessing the da same data store in slightly different ways. It kills all the benefits, because now each time I read that, I have to reinterpret the data. Every single query converts it from ASCII into type storage, and then does this and does that, in order to just read the damn data. So there is a cost to schema on read for everything. And you won't really see it until you get to that second system or that second use. But the real question here is, a, is what is your assumption? Why are you saying this is the answer for everything? It's not the answer for everything. It's the answer for some things. There's a nuanced view, but everybody falls into either or politicized thinking. I think the best thing we could do in this country would be to send Congress off for five or six years, give all of the political advertising a break so we could stop thinking in black and white because it's everywhere, right? Key value stores, sequence files in Hadoop, it's a key and a value, and the value is meh. The other side, of course, is our side, everything in a table with these five or six different data types, and that's all you can do. You wanna do what? Sorry, that's not gonna go in here. We need flexibility in the data models. We need the ability to do stuff, and it all boils down to what are you trying to do? I'm just doing quick get, fetch, read, writing, I'm just trying to write my output as fast as it comes in. I'm trying to write really complex queries. I'm trying to process and transform data. You need flexibility on some axes and not flexibility on other axes, and it totally depends on your use. So maybe the answer is to reduce some of the rigidity inside the relational database itself. So we can't really solve these problems by just thinking in either or models and thinking in these old ways. We have to think about different ways. One of the problems when you have these ridiculous context diagrams with thousands of data sources out there and more coming in all the time and users downloading data sets and sideloading them in your BI tool, you can't get in front of it. You can't gather requirements, model, collect the data, and then analyze it. You can't have this hourglass funnel thing that all goes through the one piece in the middle because you can't keep up. This was the problem of Yahoo back in the early days of search. Before there was search, there were directories. You submitted a website, a person categorized that website and said that is a retail. That is a blog about history. So we'll put it in the history section. 
Eventually, after having hundreds upon hundreds of people doing nothing but cataloging submitted websites every day, along came other people who said, you know, the machine can read this stuff and maybe we can just search. And of course, that killed it. We are the equivalent of directories. The new stuff often gives us possibilities of having search. So instead of trying to model, then collect, and then analyze everything, which creates a human bottleneck, you have to start thinking about, maybe we just collect the data. Then we analyze some of it. If we figure out it's useful enough, we'll build a model for it. So you can actually let the users do some of the work. They get data, they're doing this now anyway. You don't know it, but that Tableau thing on that desktop is pulling data from three systems that aren't in the data warehouse. And so they're collecting and analyzing. And at some point, we need the visibility to say, oh, that's reusable. Let's, let's take that in and model it. The promote piece is the point where suddenly you can take things that somebody else created and push them into the production infrastructure rather than letting them continue to happen out at the edge like they do now. It's the same argument we had against spread marts. The problem now is that everybody's got technology to bypass the warehouse if they would like to. And so we're going from a shift in design methodologies from plan to evolutionary. So the fundamental problem we've got isn't databases, it's not the data, it's not people, it's not data modeling, it's the architecture. Because the architecture defines what people do and it constrains what people can do. And so it's not technology either, it's not replace X with Y. Take out your database and put it in a Hadoop cluster. Wrong answer. You have to look at the workloads. We have workloads for transaction processing. They're solved, we know them really well. We know the problems of business intelligence really well. The analytics problems we haven't quite figured out. Now when you take the data problems and you mix in real time and analytics and BI, all the sort of consumptive layers, it gets really complicated. And if you break it down with these attributes, you're looking at things like what kind of access do I have? Uh, how predictable are queries? You know, analytics queries are incredibly predictable because all they do is a full table scan again and again and again. I can optimize the hell out of that. I can just stick it in a file. May not be the right answer, but most analytics really just does that. The building of that data set that you're analyzing, that's a whole different problem. Um, the predictability varies. The amount of data you process varies. The kind of model that you use varies. You're in a multi-model world and you just don't realize it yet. So what's happened is that we focused so much on the light switches that we forgot that the thing we wanted was light. We see a BI problem. The reality is you've got a decision-making problem for which BI may or may not be the answer. So we're running around with hammers trying to hammer all the nails, only they're not all nails. So what do we need to do? We need to look at the data architecture and think about it a little bit. And we need to look at the technology and think about it. The core of the data warehouse is not the database, it's the data architecture that the database implements. The warehouse architecture says, here's what we wanna do. The blueprint is we wanna do this in SQL Server with this ETL tool and that BI tool. Or we wanna do this in flat files and Teradata and Marts and this. Those are implementation details, blueprints of the architecture. And it's gotta be able to deal with four things. Schema and data change. Things that don't require upfront modeling in order to get data and make it accessible. Structures of data that encompass more than just tables. Link structures, nested structures, and dealing with data latency. Not just batches, not just inserts, streaming data to bulk. So I need to go from microseconds to days. And um, that means you need to think about the data model and the data architecture differently. Think about it as a supply chain. You've got raw ingredients on one side and you've got donuts on the other side. And you know what we do is we say we're a donut shop. Well, the reality is that some people don't want donuts. They want cupcakes. They want bread. And so you can have a set of ingredients, you can even make dough and batter, which can be made into multiple things, but the further to the right you go, the more finished the product is, the more constrained is its use. <coughs> Analytics people often do not use the data warehouse. They don't use the data warehouse because they don't want the donuts. They need the raw data because they have to do things to data that we have changed as we have taken it from source into a dimensional model. 
that cause problems for analytics. And so they bypass the data warehouse and go to the source. Problem is they go to the source. Wouldn't it be nice if they could just go back two hops in the data architecture? So you have to think about decoupling everything into a few different layers. And it varies based on need. On one layer, you've got data collection. Stuff is streaming in. You might collect it in real time via replication. You might ETL it. Then, separate from collection, you've got the management and the integration of data. And then, separate from that is the persistence for use. So if you think about this architecture, imagine what happens if you have streaming data. I've dealt with video game telemetry. It's coming in in real time at incredible volumes. If there's a change in the data and my table doesn't match it, I lose all my data that's coming in. So what do I do? I decouple it. The data architecture has one piece here for collection. I never modify that data. It is there for as long as my warehouse is there. It has more data than is in my warehouse because it's collecting data that we're not querying. In the middle, I'm gonna clean up some of this data and restore it in a standardized form. I may put it into a database at this point. That's an implementation detail. I may integrate it, clean it up, do other things to a minimal level, but not to the level that we do today. And then the third piece is, what else is in a data warehouse? A query schema. Why is it in the same database that you're doing ETL in? That doesn't really make a lot of sense other than a few things about data movement and some other stuff. So maybe you physically instantiate that separately, or at least logically instantiate and manage that separately. Because you might need cubes. You might need flat files for R. You might need a dimensional model for query. You might need all three. If you need all three, you need a management layer that's gonna feed out to all three. The, the warehouse and query are really two separate problems. And so you need to be able to retail the data. So what do we do? We need to break down the monolithic architecture that we've defined. Because we have a monolith and there's only one way to deal with it and, and take it out into components. Separate collection from management from use. Because you may have more than one data model for more than one use using a different engine. A linear algebra engine is different from a graph engine, is different from a relational database engine. They may all operate on exactly the same data set but they need the data in slightly different physical forms, which means you need to be able to feed data into those different physical forms, which means you need to manage the data back here and have multiple points of delivery. Architecture is also not just tech, and it's not just data, it's also people. So you have to think about the technology, how you organize people, and the methodology. And these are self-reinforcing, it's like a three-legged stool. Introduce Agile into your BI organization, lop off a piece of one leg of the stool and you have an unsteady stool. What do you have to do? Change the methods by which you do things, great. I better reorganize my staff because having them in a layer of storage admin, sysadmin, DBA, data architect, BI guy, makes for a very slow layer cake process of communication and coordination across these things is difficult. It's the architecture that dictates this. And the organization of people reinforces the architecture. So you're trying to be agile and everything else is slowing you down. Agile architecture, on the other hand, if I build you this wonderful thing that's changeable and can do anything, without the methods to go along with it, doesn't produce great results either. The three-legged stool needs three even stools, but you have to start somewhere. And so you start by making it slightly uneven and then leveling the other legs. How do you get to be more agile? I would say a simple thing to do to yourself um, is to start by doing faster deployments, right? Deploy faster, and then suddenly you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised because things will break. If you try to deploy weekly or daily, and you're used to three, every three months doing a time box release, processes are gonna break all over the place. And you're gonna find things and you're gonna fix them because you're doing them often enough that you will automate the crap out of anything that slows you down or creates problems that cause coordination. And once you've started to do that, you'll recognize that the technology stack you're using and the data architecture you're using are also in the way. That's the point. The point of recognition of all of the developers of, wait a minute, we're doing this, but the system won't let us. Now you can start thinking about how you're going to introduce new architectural elements and change what you're doing bit by bit. Because the world that we created was one type of data date times, floats, and bar chars, that's it. In tables, 
and only persisted at a rate that we can record into the database. And by the way, the only way to get the data back out is SQL. That's a smaller box than what really exists out there, and we just forgot that there was a lot more out there. And so now we need to start thinking about any structure, any latency, any process in any form. And it's been positioned to you by the vendors in our market and by the big data guys as a technology problem. Technology industry is a fashion industry. What's the latest craze? Two years ago, it was Hadoop with MapReduce. Now, it's Hadoop with Spark. MapReduce, blah. Last year was short collars. This year, it's long collars. It changes all the time. And so what you really need to think about is, what is the problem for which that technology is an answer, or that technology, or that technology? Don't take the technology forward and say, this can solve these problems, let's go do this. Say, what problems do I really have? What assumptions that I'm working from? Which is thinking like an architect. There is no more enterprise standard. You can't go to IBM or Oracle and buy a stack that's gonna solve all these problems. You have to think about what works. You're back to pragmatic architecture of 20 years ago. And so, in conclusion, I'd like to say, the future, according to some scientists, will be exactly like the past, only far more expensive. So with that, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.